Natalia Melman Petrozella, an assistant professor of history at the New School in New York City, guest lectured at the University of Wisconsin Madison's School of Human Ecology in Christine Whelan's Fall 2014 class, Consuming Happiness. Professor Petrozella's talk, Sex, Spirituality, and the Popularization of Yoga in Modern America, focused on the emergence of the wellness culture in the United States, taking us through the social history of individualism and the fitness culture to show how many disparate voices have today converged on the yoga mat. In an interview after class, I asked her how yoga became so popular. I think yoga is a really interesting um, symbol of this kind of emerging interest and fascination with pursuing wellness in American culture. And so if we take yoga as an example, we can really see how the 1950s established this cultural context where we had an affluent society. So some of the indicators of that, which, with which of course you're familiar, are kind of a therapeutic culture, more leisure time, um, more money to spend, concern about the way that um, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, suburban and white collar life was depleting the physical vitality of both men and women in this period. So I think that that kind of created the cultural context, which would give mm -hmm. rise to yoga. Fast forward a little bit, you have a variety of events, the counterculture of the 1960s, this resistance to authority, connected a connectedness to kind of sexual and physical expression, mm -hmm. rejection of kind of spiritual authorities and disillusionment with them. The 1965 Immigration Act, which brought many South Asians into the United States, which allowed for the proliferation of yoga in a new way. So that whole constellation of circumstances kind of created an environment where yoga could begin to take hold as an American mm -hmm. fascination. It had been around since long before then. And then um, going on from there, I mean, in the 1970s, as this begins to move from kind of the hippie margins in places like um, the Esalen Institute or in Kripalu in, in Pennsylvania, you you have this kind of moving definitely through the kind of liberal elite yeah. into popular culture. And I think one of the ways that it moved into popular culture rather readily was through this emphasis on individualism because you really see that in the same way that a kind of countercultural enclave like the Esalen Institute can focus on self-actualization and human potentiality, you have someone like Ayn Rand celebrating in the virtue of selfishness, um, self-esteem and self-worth. That kind of allowed what would be eventually become a convergence, which I think converged in some ways on the yoga mat. At the same time, this rise of a fitness culture where you have the um, fascination with jogging as a, as a hobby, where you have the emergence of health clubs, where you have women first interested in reducing regimes and then and dance exercise. All of that kind of emerges, mm -hmm. combines with a broad-based spirituality, which had always been, or, or you know, became part of um, kind of yoga culture and now mm -hmm. engages many Americans. All of that kind of begins to come together so that by the 1990s, yoga is not only a spiritual practice, a physical practice, but also a consumer practice. So you really have yoga as infiltrating yes. many parts of American life. So when I think of yoga, I think of Lululemon. I think of getting yoga pants and the yoga mat and all the yoga equipment. And you pay for to go to a yoga mm -hmm. class. So it's this very interesting tension of a sort of spiritual practice that is also a very consumer Absolutely. Right. Now, a lot of people, myself included, would definitely bristle at the idea that Lululemon is yoga. But I think that you're right that this is definitely right. a, um, a... Lululemon has done a lot to shape yoga culture in North America. Yes. There's no question about it. And a lot of people would say to corrupt it. Um, but I think that, yeah, Lululemon was founded in 1998. And I think that that really marks, in many ways, a high point of this period when yoga became a very, very profitable market segment, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And I mean, that's the same year that Yoga Journal was sold um, and became, went from being a nonprofit to being owned by an investment banker and then later in 2006 was bought by a large media group. Mm -hmm. So I think that that really, the 1990s were really crucial in kind of cementing yoga as a consumer product like you're talking about, but also there were larger cultural factors at work during that period that contributed to that as well. As well. If you think about 
the end of the Cold War, for example, which can seem very distant from this. But the end of the Cold War, not only did this kind of prompt in some ways a turning inward in the United States, but also, for example, look at reforms in education. We went from this kind of panicked um, sense that we have to catch up. You know, there was this 1982 report, A Nation at Risk, we're failing in all the hard academics, to the rise of multicultural um, education and self-esteem education, right? Mm -hmm. Those two things in themselves, which became major educational reform movements, controversial ones, really behooved a kind of cultural acceptance of a foreign practice focused on self-improvement that yes. you know, really is what yoga is in American culture today. And we see that with the rise of the self-help movement generally. Yeah. We see the intersection of science and religion, of the sort of the persuasive powers of research, and this is going to help you in all these great ways, mm -hmm. with the spiritual practices of trust in a higher power, trust mm -hmm. in God, and you will be saved in this life and the next. Absolutely. And I see yoga as sort of going part and parcel with that whole rise of of that intersection of, of spiritual and scientific. Absolutely, and I think one of the, as a historian, you know, I'm always looking for the sources, and I think yeah. that one of the best sources that I found on this are the historical um, editions of Yoga Journal, yeah. where you can really see that there was this magazine, which was for years the magazine for the yoga community, and now is contested mm -hmm. in, in many ways, but their whole commitment was to both be a voice for the spiritual community, but to also deliver science, right? And that yes. science was at some, in some ways it was science, it was, there was a metaphysical dimension to it that would have been probably rejected by kind of sure. mainstream um, uh, the, the, by the mainstream disciplines but in other ways the, it was um, promoting and you know publishing articles on kind of like the anatomical and the physiological effects of yoga sure. on um, fertility articles on conscious sure. conception and I think that all of that kind of especially I have looked most closely at um, the talk about sexuality but this idea of the way you kind of bring together a scientific sensibility and a spiritual one is really fascinating I think yoga is a site where that really um, mm -hmm. comes to bear, especially as in the United States it's become a kind of physical exercise practice mm -hmm. as much, if not more, as a yeah. spiritual one. Right. Yeah. And if you bring it together with the consumer culture, so my class is on consuming happiness. Yeah. I feel like when you, when you, go, when you get a, a yoga membership or, or you, you sign up for a batch of classes, mm -hmm. what are some of, what do you, what are, in your research, what are some of the reasons why people would decide to start a yoga practice? What are they trying to, to get? I think there are a lot of different reasons. So one of the most popular ones, and this comes out of the 90s too, and we had this big um, national craziness over the people are stressed out. They're too, mm -hmm. We were stressed mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. were too stressed, right? So you find people going to take yoga for lots of reasons. They feel too physically stressed. They want to lose weight. They want to become more limber. They want to be, they're maybe a little bit disillusioned with gym culture, and they want mm -hmm. something a little bit more transcendent. They want a mm -hmm. kind of spiritual space. They want to meditation practice. Mm -hmm. um, so you have really this full like constellation yeah. of reasons. And I think really today yoga is something that um, has come Come to um, be kind of a catch-all for so many of these American pursuits, which is why it's gained such popularity recently, I think. And one of the things that I love about you is that you are not just a researcher of this, but you are a practitioner. And so can you tell us a little bit about your work with Intensati and sort of how you join your practice and your and your research profession. Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm not really a yogi by any no. stretch. I take yoga sometimes, but I'm not a yoga instructor, but I do teach this practice you mentioned called Intensati, which is inten is intention, sati is a word for mindfulness. This was created by a woman named Patricia Moreno, a great teacher of mine. And I was um, you know, it's a practice where you combine movement with affirmations. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the idea of a kind of moving meditation comes straight out of yoga. Yeah. Me personally, as someone who'd taken quite a few yoga classes, I never found that kind of transcendent feeling that many people mm -hmm. associate with yoga. I love the gym and working out. But I was also left, as a feminist especially, I was left a little bit empty by these classes where you would go in and have the instructor yelling at you to torch fat and mm -hmm. to burn off your, you know, uh, calories from the weekend for bikini season. And even though I love the physical purgation of it, um, which I realize is a religious term, I just couldn't get on board with which is this body hatred. So intensati is a practice that combines positive self-talk with, um, 
with uh, movement. And when I found it, I was shocked that I liked it because I always thought I was kind of above this woo-woo stuff and that self-help was something for, you know, people mm-hmm. who weren't as smart as I was, surely, right? <laughs> and then I, um, and then when I started taking this class, I realized I not only was getting into great physical shape, but I was also being nicer, being more productive, mm-hmm. you know, feeling better, less anxious. And so long story short, I ended up being, becoming certified as a teacher and it's my, been my kind of deep engagement in this world of wellness mm-hmm. as a participant um, which has fueled in many ways my research interest yes. in it. In part because it's funny, people have always seen me as, oh, you're that positive person in the front row of class or the teacher, but I've never been able to turn off my critical analytical eye to this. So like I might be an enthusiastic consumer of some of this stuff, but I look at most self-help out there and I'm kind of revolted as a scholar, as a feminist, Absolutely. as a historian, as a social critic by what's <laughs> there. But I'm fascinated by how it's become a national preoccupation of which I'm a part, right? Yes. And I do think, so that's kind of the way I balance that positionality, mm-hmm. but I also think it is important for the critical eye that I talk about not to fall into the trap that I feel mo- much of the scholarship on this topic does, which is this kind of dismissiveness, yes. right? Which is this, oh, this is silly. This is a kind of, Absolutely. you know, uh, um, just a kind of like cheap diversion for right. for the masses. And I think that that is really misplaced. It's a major, major cultural movement. And Tens it deserves, of billions of dollars. Yeah, it deserves our serious attention. Absolutely. Yeah. And I see yoga kind of, and, and in Tensati, and on all of these sort of movements that combine physical with, with spiritual, as also part of the rise of the purpose and meaning-seeking movement. And so when I talk about the history of self-help, mm-hmm. I used to divide it into four categories, and now I divide, I've added a fifth, mm-hmm. because we started with religious self-help, and then we went to the pragmatic Dale Carnegie and yes. those sorts of how-to right. manuals. Then we moved toward the inner directed that the 1980s of, you know, your inner child is broken right, right, and right. recovery. Yeah. And then you got into what I would call the personal action, sort of just do it, of yeah. Dr. Phil and yeah. Ileana Van Zandt saying, you know, this is, this is how and you Nike. Got and Nike, right. yeah, of course, right. Right? Who, who is doing that intersection with exercise. Yeah. But now I see that the new trend is toward kind of, if you're looking up Maslow's hierarchy of need, yeah. really toward the self-actualization, toward purpose and meaning. And I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, don't want to speak for you, but I see yoga as very much part of that purpose and meaning seeking movement, absolutely. even more so than it was part of any of the other ones. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Part of that purpose and meaning seeking movement. But I also think in part because it's a physical practice that mm-hmm. it engages many, like the more pragmatic, the seven yes. habits of highly effective people is not so different from the very structured um, uh, sequence of poses in certain, like in, in Ashtanga practice, yes. you will do the same series umpteen times, right? right? And I think that that is, um, that those kind of converge. And I also think when I'm talking about yoga, I'm really talking about yoga culture and what it's done. And it has, in for exactly the reasons that you talk about it, in the ways that you discuss, it's shaped Let's just talk right now for an example of exercise culture. Sure. Inten Sati would not exist, and the creator of it, no. Patricia would tell you, would not exist if she hadn't done Anusara yoga training, right? Mm-hmm. Like it absolutely was yoga yeah. culture shaping um, group fitness, right? Yeah. Another, probably the most popular example today is Soul Cycle. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. ever taken a class before, but um, a Soul Cycle class, it's an indoor cycling class, absolutely, infused with this kind of purpose-seeking, quasi-spiritual language. What I think is interesting, and I say this truly without judgment, perhaps because I'm not a particularly religious person, but it's interesting when we look at, like, what does the spirituality actually mean? What is being propounded in here? I do think it's more than a bunch of kind of feel-good platitudes or homilies, but all in all, it doesn't cohere as much more than a kind of feel-good... you know, be your best yes. in the moment. There's not, um, you know, there's a di- dimension of discipline to it, but there, I think some people would say that there's no, like, there's no sense of, um, of consequence necessarily. In sure, it, right? of building self-efficacy, right? Exactly. So, yeah. so I think these classes can help build self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Are they going to really, tra- ha- how do people take the next steps to, to actually build the self-efficacy to go do something outside of the class? So this is why, to me, I think I found Intensati so motivating, mm-hmm. and I think that some of these other exercise formats, including yoga, which I'll call an exercise format to great you know, controversy, <laughs> potentially, but I think that that's in some ways why they are gaining such popularity, because you're already doing the something. It's not just going to sit with your therapist or in some consciousness-raising group uh, and talk about what you're going to do. You're punching and saying, I am strong. You're being strong. 
by punching right there. You're saying, I'm going to give my best, I'm going to do it. You're not sitting there with a cup of coffee saying, when I leave here, you're on that bike oh, pedaling that. as yeah. fast as you can. So there's already this built-in self-efficacy. In my intense sati classes, I always say, you guys, what we do in here is a template. If you are in here and you're saying, I can do it right now, and you're jumping a little bit higher, mm -hmm. doing three more jumping jacks, you've just proven to yourself you can transcend what you thought your limits were. Jumping jacks, I'm really happy you can do a few more jumping jacks. I'm really happy if you burned a few more calories. But the whole point is you use that as a template for what you can accomplish in your life at large, right? So if you think you can do a few awesome. more jumping jacks and you've done it in here, awesome. go out there and send that email to your boss that you didn't think you could do. Go out there and log in a few more extra hours writing that novel you thought you were too lazy or too incompetent to do. And so you build that sense mm -hmm. of capacity and self-efficacy within the exercise format. And to me, that's just as important as having an, a coherent spiritual philosophy undergirding it. I don't really think that's the key thing mm -hmm. here. So all of this is hopefully going to appear in your forthcoming book that you are that you are researching. And, yes, forthcoming in a while, but yes, right. I'm working on it. So I'm working on this new book about um, the emergence of wellness culture in America um, through the pursuit of food and fitness regimes since the 1950s. And so the idea is that these ostensibly physical pursuits, what you eat and how you work your body, have been really connected to the pursuit of well-being um, in America since the 50s. And so I'm looking at, I'm still, still in the making right now, but I'm looking at a variety of these different regimes to kind of make that point and explore. I can't wait to read it. It's going to be fascinating. I can't wait to write it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank this was you. Terrific. It's great to be here. Thanks. Great.